Acts chapter 4. This is one of my, my favorite chapters to go back to. The Lord has used it in my life to be a great encouragement to me. And um, the Lord initially showed this to me while I was in England. Um, I grew up a very quiet individual, individual, a very introverted individual. I didn't like speaking to people. Uh, to be honest with you, my, the most comfortable place for me was in my own little corner where no one else was, and I could just be with myself, my own thoughts, that kind of thing. But um, as I got older and I began to learn more about what the Lord has for us to do, I realized that if I'm going to be able to do that, I'm going to have to step out a little bit and open my mouth and speak to people. And uh, so the Lord used this, this chapter in my life to help me with that and encourage me, and I'm praying it's going to be a help to you as well. We're looking here at Acts chapter 4, and we're going to read again through several verses to help us get the context. It says in verse number 1, And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, or by what name, have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set in not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved." Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had communed them, commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, because of the people. For the man glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old, on whom this miracle of healing was shown. Again, we'll have a word of prayer. If you'll pray with me, I would greatly appreciate it. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have to come together and for the freedom that we have to do this, Lord. I pray that we would never forget that and never take it for granted. I pray that you would please, again, speak to our hearts. Help us to draw closer to you. Lord, help us. If, if there's anyone here today that needs to make a decision, I pray that they would do that today. And Lord, if there is anyone here that does not know you as their Savior, I pray that they would come forward and speak to someone and get that cleared. So that they wouldn't leave here without 100% assurance that you have died on the cross, that you buried and you rose again. You paid their sin debt. Lord, please help us as we continue through this service to lift you up and to glorify you in all that we say and do. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we're looking here at Acts chapter 4, and again, we just read through that to kind of help us have some context, but let's look back at verse number 13. There's a specific phrase in this verse that I want to point out to you and talk about this morning. Verse number 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. Now we're looking at the life, the, the, the people, Peter and John, and this was their testimony. As they were among all these people who didn't like them, they didn't like what they're saying to them, they didn't like what they were preaching, they wanted them to stop, and they were threatening them. Standing among those people, this is what was noticed about them. They had been with Jesus. And many of us, as we go out into this world, all of us, as we go out into this world, we have 
a testimony, I wonder what our testimony says. Often we are related to other people. Uh, I think of my own self, I've, I go around and people look at me and they say, you're Joe McPike's son, aren't you? And I'm like, yes. They say that because that's my dad. Of course, I'm related to him uh, by birth, but also I, I look like him, I talk like him, different things like that. So people can very easily look at me and say, you're Joe McPike's son. And to me, that's a very encouraging thing. It's a great thing because I love my dad. I think he's a wonderful person. But there is no greater person that we can be related to than the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. As they go out into this world and people look at us, who do they see? Do they see just Chris McPike, just another guy? Or do they see my dad? Or do they see my Father in heaven? Do they see the Lord Jesus Christ living in me and living out of me? Who do they see when they look at me? What kind of testimony do I have? We are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ as they go out into this world. We are representatives of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who do people see in us? As we look at Peter and John, we, we see that they had that testimony. And so I kind of want to take a moment and look back at the life of Peter and John and see maybe some things that they did in their lives that helped them get to this point to have this testimony so that we can apply those same things to our lives. So let's look back a little bit, back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to kind of see where this started to begin. Matthew chapter 4, we'll begin reading in verse number 18. How did Peter and John have this testimony that they had been with Jesus? Verse number 18, it says, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. As we're thinking about the life of Peter and John, what is it that, that helped them have this testimony? Well, I want you to notice that there is a process that, ha that had to take place. And again, if you go back to, to verse number 19, He saith unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. There is a process. Firstly, He says, follow me. In other words, come be with me. Spend time with me, and let me show you what you ought to do, how you ought to speak, what you ought to say, how you ought to act, all these different things. Come spend time with me and let me show you. Follow me. Firstly, if we want to have this same kind of testimony, we must obey the call. And that call is to spend time with Christ. I know it's a very simple thought, but honestly, this is something that is so simple that we, we tend to overlook. This is not just a, a matter of just spending time with Him for about a few minutes in the morning, closing the Bible, and then going on about our day. This is daily, moment by moment, living with Christ. Christ promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We can take Him with us no matter where we go. Christ will go with us. We can spend time with Christ. And as we do that, He will teach us. He will help us. He will show us what we ought to do. Think of, think of He said this, Go be fishers. What does that mean, God? What does it mean to be fishers? Go be fishers of men. What, am I supposed to cast out a line and reel in a man? This is, this is interesting, Lord. But he didn't just say that. He said, first of all, come be with me and let me show you and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus Christ is our greatest example, our greatest testimony. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Jesus Christ has given us his example. Are we taking the time to look to him so that we can see that example? Are we taking the time to spend with him so that we can learn more about him and follow him? Do what he tells us to do. 
How are we able to know more about him and to grow in that relationship with him if we don't spend time with him? It's like this. My wife and I have been married for about three years now. We went back to the day of our wedding, and we said our vows. We said, I do. We get to the end of the aisle, and we say to each other, all right, this is great. This is wonderful. We're married now. Let's get back together in a couple weeks. We'll grab a cup of coffee. We'll talk things over. We'll see how this thing works out. Probably not going to work out too well, is it? Why? Because I'm not spending the necessary time with her to get to know her likes, to know her dislikes, to know how to please her. It's that very same thing with Christ. If we are not spending the necessary time with Him to know more about Him, to know how to please Him, how are we going to please Him? How are we going to know what to do? I know it's a very simple thought, but it is the main point throughout this whole message. We must spend time with Christ. Obey the call. Spend time with Christ. And this is exactly what Peter and John did. They were able to walk with Christ. They were able to see how He lived, see how He acted, see what He said. And we can do that very same thing because He's given us His Word. We can see who Christ is. We can see what He has done. And we can follow His example. Obey the call. Spend time with Christ. They not only did that, but as they learned more about Christ, they were obedient to God's command. And as we look through the Word of God, we see different things that God wants us to do. We're going to see very specifically the command that He gives in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 this morning. And again, this is a very familiar verse, one that we've all read and maybe even memorized. But Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 but it says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus gives this command to the believers. Jesus gives this command to each and every one of us. And if we're going to have this same kind of testimony, we can't just spend time with Christ, but we've also got to be obedient to follow what He says to do. And if He says, go be witnesses, that, that's a command. That's something we must obey. I think sometimes we think of it as a suggestion. I know I did when I was growing up. The Lord would put it on my heart and say, I want you to go speak to that person. And I'll say, eh, I don't know if this is the right time, Lord. I don't know if I'm the right person. Maybe not. I'll do it at another time. We can't think of it that way. If God has said, go do this, Again, like we learned about this morning with Abraham, if God says go, we've got to be obedient. We've got to have the faith to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do. And trust Him to supply what we need. But it is a command. It's not a suggestion. And it's a command to go. Another misconception that I had when I was younger that was that if I just invited someone to come to church with me, I've done my part. And that is something good, something that we should do. We ought to invite people to come and join us and be a part of our service so they can hear the preaching of the Word of God. But this ought not be the only place that they hear the preaching of the Word of God. As we go out into this world and we invite them in, we also ought to take the time to say, let me show you who Christ is. What He's done in my life. Let me show that to you. So that you can have it in your life as well. The command is to go out into this world and preach the Gospel. The command is to go to everyone. I don't know about you, but that is, that is a great encouragement to me. God did not save this so great salvation just for a handful of people. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Again in verse number 8, You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, there is no wrong person that you can give the gospel to. Every person that we go to, we have the opportunity to open up the Word of God and show to them who Christ is and what He has done for us. And that is a command that God has given to each and every one of us. If you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior today, that is a command to you. And we must be obedient to that if we're going to have the same kind of testimony that Peter and John had. But again, thankfully, we don't have to do this on our own, do we? In John 15, verse 5, we're actually reminded that we can't do this on, the road, on our own. He says in verse number 5, For without me, ye can do nothing. We need the Lord Jesus to come with us and to help us. And He has not left us on our own as He left this earth. 
He left us with the great comforter. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 1, it says in verse number 4, And being s- assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, and not many days hence. So firstly, Jesus says to them, Go to Jerusalem and wait. Just a few verses later, he says, I want you to go and tell everyone the gospel. But first of all, go to Jerusalem, wait. Wait for the promise. And after you receive that promise, the gift of the Holy Spirit, then go out with the power of the Holy Spirit and preach the gospel. They obeyed that command. And you see that as you read through this book of Acts in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when they received the Holy Spirit, those events drew a crowd. And what did Peter do? He preached the gospel. You go to Acts chapter 3. The Lord allows Peter and John to heal this lame man who's been lame from birth. That again draws another crowd. What does Peter do? He preaches the gospel. And let's go back to Acts chapter 4 as we go into our next point. They obeyed the call. They obeyed the command. But it's not just that they obeyed. It's how they obeyed. As they were giving the gospel... Uh, because they were giving the gospel, we now come into the situation that we're in in Acts chapter 4. And it says in verse number 1, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They didn't like what they were saying. They didn't like they were, they were preaching the entirety of the gospel. They didn't mind that they were talking about how Jesus Christ came to earth. They didn't mind them talking about Jesus Christ had died and that He was buried. That's fine. That's all good and well. No worries. But they were preaching that Jesus Christ had risen again. And if He rose again, that means He is who He truly says He is. When we preach the Gospel, we must preach it in its entirety. We can't leave any part of it out. And they understood that. That was part of the command. We must preach the Gospel. And that's exactly what they did And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even tied. And we'll skip down to verse number 6. They put them in basically like a prison, and now they're holding a trial for Peter and John. Excuse me, verse number 5. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many was, as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, and neither is there salvation in any other. But there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now as you're reading through that, does it, does it sound like Peter is questioning what he's saying? Not at all. He is saying it with much confidence. And they notice that. You see that in the next verse. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Boldness has kind of two meanings. One meaning is courage, and I think that's the one that we typically go to. And we do need courage as we go out and give the gospel. But What also comes along with that word boldness is confidence. They saw the boldness. They saw the confidence of Peter and John. As they spoke about Christ, as they spoke about the things that He had done, there was no doubt in their mind. There was no wonder. There was no question. They said, this is the truth. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried and He rose again. This is the truth. And this is what we must preach. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. These men obeyed with confidence. As they went out and they preached the gospel, there was no question. Read, read, continue on in verse number 15. These men, they didn't like that answer, so they're convening among themselves, trying to figure out what can we do to stop them from speaking the gospel. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. 
And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They could not help it. They had to speak those things. Why? Because it is what they had seen and what they had heard. It is what they had experienced for themselves. It wasn't just something that someone had told them about, but they had actually accepted Christ into their life and they saw Him working in their life. And because of that, they could speak confidently about Christ. If you have not accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to have a difficult time talking about who Christ is and what He's done. Because you haven't truly come to know that for yourself. It doesn't change the fact that it's the truth, but you can't speak confidently about it. Because you haven't come to know that it is the truth. But when, when you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior and you've seen what God can do, you go through life, you take Him with you, you see as you speak to people, He gives you the words to say, you see as, he, as you read through the Word of God, He reveals those things to you, you are then able to confidently take those things and preach and teach them to others as well. But what did you have to do to get to that point? Back to the main point of this whole message, you must spend time with Christ. It is very difficult to talk about someone who we don't spend any time with. We must spend time with Christ. And as we get into the Word of God, we can have clarity. We can have assurance of our salvation. We can have the knowing that this is the truth. And if I could, I just want to nail this, this point down and, and then we'll be through. Look with me at Luke chapter 1. And very quickly after that, we're going to turn to 1 John chapter 5. Luke chapter 1, and verse number 1 says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And again, turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, or I'll just read it to you. 1 John chapter 5. Verse number 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. As we read through both of these passages, what is something very clear that these two verses are telling us? We can have certainty. We can know. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to fear, is this the truth or is it not? We can know these things, but how? How do we have this, this knowing? How do we have this certainty, this assurance? What does it say right before that? These things have I written unto you. God has given us His Word. He's given us His example. He's shown us what we ought to do, how we ought to live, and, and all of these things. He's revealed Himself to us. How do we have assurance? By spending time with Him. Taking every opportunity that we have, getting up in the morning, having our devotional time, going throughout the day, meditating on what He has taught us, coming to church, hearing the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Every opportunity that we have, don't neglect that. Spend time with Christ. And the more that we get to know Him, the more that we're obedient and we see Him working in and through our lives, the more confidence that we can have and we can go out with and speak about Him. We must spend time with Christ. I'll close on a word of prayer and Pastor Phil will close us out as you see fit. Father, again, we thank you for this time that we have to hear from your word. I pray that you would please speak to every one of our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would not leave here empty. And again, if there is anyone here that does not know you as their Savior, please don't let them leave without knowing you first. 
We love you, Lord, and thank you for everything that you do for us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, if you want to be a teacher, you spend time around teachers. You spend time getting an education in teaching and how to present information and truths to people and and how to communicate those truths to people. And then, then you go practice being teaching. You practice teaching, right? Uh, if you want to learn how to be a welder, well, you're going to have to touch a welder. <laughs> you're going to have to get a little dirty, smell a little smoke. You're going to have to be willing to take the heat. But you're going to have to spend some time at it, practicing it, doing it. It doesn't matter what it is. In order to get good at anything, you've got to spend time. You know, we send our young people off sometime to go to college. They want to learn how to be a vet or veterinarian, a vet tech. They want to learn how to uh, do... um, uh, take care of finances. They want to learn how to teach. They want to learn how to do this thing or that thing or whatever it is. Why do we send them to college? No, it's not to party. It's not to have friends. It's not to get your MR or MS degree, MRS degree. That's, that's not it. And I know we've kind of lost the way there. It doesn't matter what it is that you set out to do or to learn. It all takes the same thing in the end. You're going to have to spend some time. And I'll say this. If you want to know Jesus, if you want to know about him, if you want to obey him, if you want to, if you want to understand him and understand the things that he said, there's only one thing you've got to do. Aside from knowing him, you've got to spend time with him. So if you ever look back at your life and go, boy, I wonder, I wonder how Brother McPike got to where he knew he could open the Bible and, 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 and explain it. And i tell you how. It's, there's no secret here. He spent time with the Lord. He spent time with God's Word. He spent time studying. He spent time around people who studied it and around people who knew these things. And in our age, in our time that we live in, these perilous times that we're living in, you have a great opportunity to learn many things. Many of them aren't worth learning, but people put things on the internet You can go to YouTube or Facebook or all kinds of places. You can go all over the place. You can learn from people on the other side of the planet. The question is, are you worth learning something worth learning? Or you can learn about the Lord Jesus Christ and gain confidence in Him and in His Word and in His will It's all a matter of choice, isn't it? What is it that I want to get good at? What is it that I want to be confident in and about? And then that, from that question, you can rein in, you can, you can maybe tune out those things that won't help you learn that thing that you want to know about. I believe there's two questions for us this morning that come out of this this message and this thought. It's the same question that Jesus asked the disciples. It's the same thing that he presented. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Well, what are the questions that he was asking? One, do you want to? Is he going to make them? No, he is not going to make you learn about him. He's not going to make you follow him. He's not going to make you become a fisher of men. 
But as Jesus passes by today, he's saying, hey, if you, if you are willing, I will teach you how to be a fisher of men. But you're going to have to follow me. And that means you're going to have to put down your nets. Two, de- two decisions, two choices, two questions. Just like our memory verse for the month. If you love father or mother more than me, son or daughter more than me, if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you all understand where that's going. It all comes down to, is he more important to me than everything else? Am I willing to follow him? And if I follow him, am I willing to learn from him and be what he wants me to be? Maybe a missionary in a foreign field. Maybe a teacher. Maybe maybe he's not going to ask you or send you anywhere else. Maybe he'll have you right here the rest of your natural earthly life. But you know what my suggestion is this morning as we hear the question, as we consider the, the, the thought, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. The question that we need to consider is, Lord, what will that have me to do? Well, yes, be a fisher of men, that is true, but where? How? Maybe you need to consider this morning coming to the altar, bowing your heart, bowing your head, bowing your life, submitting yourself and saying, Lord, Where is it that thou will have me to go? What is it that thou will have me to do? Maybe you need to fall back on last month's question. God, is there anything that you see in my life that I am holding on to that's more important to you? Will you show it to me?